Praise the Lord, everyone. This is Pastor Killingsworth from First United Pentecostal Church of Grosbeck. We are so happy that you have joined us this evening for worship. Uh, please be aware that there will be another video posted to this channel within the next two days. At some point in those next two days that will have a statement on the current COVID-19 situation uh, and how the church will proceed forward. In the meantime, thank you for joining us this evening. We're going to get out of the way and move right into a wonderful message by Reverend Carlton Watkins, a message titled, Counting the Cost. I truly hope you receive a blessing from God this evening. I want to turn your attention. I want to pick up maybe where I left off last Sunday morning. We're talking about counting the cost, the cost of discipleship. Uh, to follow Jesus as a disciple, it does have certain costs that he expects us to pay. Amen. Luke 14, chapter, 20, chapter 14, verse 25. Hallelujah. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Luke 14, verse 25. Hallelujah. I read something interesting this morning. Hallelujah. It said marriage is the only war where you sleep with your enemy. Hope that's not true in First United Pentecost Church, Dangerfield. Amen. All right, Luke chapter fourteen. Lisa got has got a smile out of you talking about that. Amen. Luke fourteen verse twenty five. And there went great multitudes with him, and he turned and he said unto them, If any man come to me and hate not his father and mother and wife and children and brethren, and sisters, yea, in his own life also. He cannot be my disciple. He cannot be my disciple. You know, that sounds kind of rough. He turns to the multitude, and he says, If any man come to me, and hate not his, mo his mother, his father, sister, brother, he covers the whole spectrum. Even his own life. He cannot be the my disciple. And then he says, And whosoever does not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. If you want to mark in verse 26, cannot, notice you can't be a disciple if you don't put him first in your life. Because we know that he's not advocating that you're supposed to hate your mom and your dad and your brothers and sisters. That's not what he's saying. But he's saying your love and devotion to him and the love for your own mother would seem like hate in comparison. That you put God ahead of everything. He wants to be number one in your life. Because you see, when you put him number one in your life, You'll love your mama like you ain't never loved her. You'll love your daddy like you ain't never loved her. You'll love your brothers and your sisters like you never loved them. Hallelujah. Because now you can really know how to love because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost. Hallelujah. And then he says, Whosoever does not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. There's some things you're going to have to just go through. You're just going to have to go through them. That's the reason, not the one that runs us with me. But it's he that endures to the end. Hallelujah. If you can just stay in there, if you can just stay in the race, we're going to win. If you can just hang in there, 
Hallelujah. We're going to win. You hear me? We're going to win. We're going to win. There's not enough devils in hell that can pluck you from the hand of God. But you can walk away anytime you want to. But if you will submit your will into the hand of God and follow after the Lord, there may be some crosses to bear. But you will not have to bear them alone. Jesus will be right there with you. Hallelujah. Amen. And then, verse 28, For which of you, intending to build a tower, sitteth not down first and counteth the cost? Rather, he hath sufficient to finish it, lest happily after he hath laid the foundation and is not able to finish it, all that behold it begin to mock him. Saying, this man began to build and was not able to finish. Or what king going to make war against another king that is not down first and consulted, whether he be able with 10,000 to meet him that cometh against him with 20,000? Or else while the other is yet a great way off, he sendeth an ambassador and desireth conditions of peace. So likewise, whosoever he be of you that forsaketh not all that he hath, he cannot be my disciple. Hallelujah. You cannot straddle the fence and be a true disciple of Jesus Christ. you got to leave the old world behind. Hallelujah. You can't even taper off of it. you just got to make up in your mind. If you'll make up in your mind and just turn loose of that other world, and all the habits that are involved in all of that. Just cold turkey. Jesus will help you. He'll help you. Hallelujah. Lord bless you. Let's ask the Lord to help us. Dear God, I'm asking you to help us. To minister your word this morning. But we will ever praise you. We'll ever thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. Lord bless you. You may be seated. Hallelujah. We're glad for Brother and Sister Bird here being with us. Amen. We want them to stand and testify. Leave word of testimony. These are friends of Brother and Sister Driscoll. All right, brother. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. 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 Hallelujah. Monty, I want you to stand. Brag on Jesus a little bit. <laughs> Hallelujah. You know what? You look different. Hey. Oh, yes. <laughs> oh, yes. Amen. Well, Lord, hallelujah. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. If you don't mind, hallelujah, I want to give the devil a black eye. I want to just dance before the Lord. That's an answer to prayer. He Oh, blessed is the name of the Lord. Le For oh, how I love him and oh, how I adore him. Oh, 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 hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Amen, 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 amen. Well, Lord, we got something to be excited about today. Hallelujah, hallelujah. 
Amen. I'm glad that I'm serving a God that He's already assured me. Amen. No weapon formed against me shall prosper. Hallelujah. Amen. You know what? You may be seated. Hallelujah. I would not be afraid. Amen. Our war that we just had with Iraq. I, I, you know, all the weapons that uh, the United States had at their disposal, it had to be so overwhelming to Iraq. It had to be. Because they brought things out nobody knew anything about. Hallelujah. And so, when you understand that you got the greatest arm in all the world behind you, hallelujah, it's easy to see that there's going to be victory. Well, I'm telling you, as a child of God, hallelujah, the United States also cannot compare to God's. And what God, hallelujah, has placed in His church He's predestined his church to win. We've already read the back of the book. Hallelujah. There's going to be a victorious church. And no weapon formed against you shall prosper. In other words, no weapon that the enemy of your soul would bring against you can be able to prosper or get an advantage of you if you'll just stay in the church Amen. And you'll learn that the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they're mighty to the pulling down of stronghold. Hallelujah. One of our weapon of prayer. My, the weapon of prayer is a powerful weapon. Hallelujah. It's able to move mountains. It's able to reach, amen, and tear down walls. It's able, amen, the, the weapon of prayer is able to get the attention of God and God intervene and move. The weapon of prayer is able to lift you up out of the mully grub. The, the weapon of prayer is able to bring you from a sad sack mentality to putting a smile on your face, a song in your heart, and a dance in your step. Hallelujah. There's been times that I, I've used the weapon of prayer. Amen. Not feeling good. Seeming like everything around me is caving in. But using the weapon of prayer. And when I get through praying and talking to the Lord. Uh, and the Lord ministering to me. I'm ready. I'm ready. To, I can whip a bear with a switch. Amen. Hallelujah. Well, if I seem a little excited this morning, I am. Amen. Because I, I'm serving a God that she's already declared we're going to be victorious. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And, and, and when you've got chur a church that's praying, hallelujah. We're a team. You, gotta, you know what? There's no long ranger Christian. Just out there trying to do your own thing. Become a part of the team. Hallelujah. Buy into the vision. And become a part of the team. And let's see what God's going to do. Hallelujah. I believe in God to give us apostolic revival. He's promised it to us. He's already declared some things. And you know what prayer is doing? It's, it's, it's establishing, it's doing something in you as an individual. It's doing something in the spirit where it's going to tear down some strongholds. Money, just, that, that's just the tip of the iceberg, what God wants to do. Hallelujah. And I'm excited about it. And, and, and this church, Monty, I want you to know this church loves you. And this church is here to help you. Hallelujah. And, and like I told you, we're going to take one day at a time. One day at a time. That's the key to living for God. You just live for God one day at a time. But let's let we got let's get the foundation right. And you're establishing it through reading the Word of God, through prayer, hallelujah, and worship and praise unto God and letting God grow in God. Hallelujah. Because greater is He that's in you than He that's in the world. Hallelujah. Well, 
I'm thankful that Jesus reached into my life one day and I came to know him as Savior of my life. He reached into my world, turned my life around, set my feet on, on a solid rock, the rock Christ Jesus, began to live for him, began to... And, and, and you know what? It wasn't too long in living for him. I realized that he didn't just want me to join up with him. You know, Jesus is not looking for a bunch of joiners. He's looking for to make a disciple out of individuals. Hallelujah. And I said it last week, if you'll give America, uh, they'll join anything. You give them a red button and a T-shirt, they'll join anything. Hallelujah. But God is not looking for people to just be mere joiners. One day Jesus is teaching, and in his teaching, he makes a statement. He said, except you drink my blood and eat my flesh, you shall have no part with me. And the Bible says that all of those people, they just seen him feed the, feed the 5,000, the miracle of the loaves and fishes. They'd seen the miraculous hand of God. And yet he makes one statement, and he loses his whole congregation, except his disciples. Hallelujah. But you know what Jesus did? He gave them a chance to check out too. <laughs> if you want to leave, he said, <laughs> if you, will you also go away? He said. And Peter jumped up. He jumped out. Both. You know, he's the first one out of the boat. He's very impetuous. Amen. But he's the only one walked on the water. <laughs> Hallelujah. The other state's secure in the boat. Amen. We, we need... Uh, a few that like the Apostle Peter that's willing to say, yes, God. And uh, Peter said, yes, Lord, we're going we're gonna to follow you. Where would we go? You, you've got there, there's nowhere to go. You've got the words of eternal life. And uh, now Peter wasn't able to say that because he understood he didn't have a clue. He didn't have a clue what Jesus was talking about. But what he was saying is, Lord, Whatever you say, I'm going to follow you. Even when I don't understand. Because I remember when I was a fisherman, an old cussing fisherman, a sinner, and you come by with words of eternal life. And I begin to follow after you. But what is so interesting when you begin to look at that, that story is that when those turned and walked away from Jesus, all because of one misunderstanding. They just misunderstood what Jesus was talking about. Because in their mind, they thought that Jesus was asking them to become cannibals. Except you drink my blood and eat my flesh, you can't have any part with me. And so he, they thought, that he's asked them to become cannibals. And the Bible says they turned and walked no more with him. Over one myth. Understand. They'd seen him do miracles. They'd listened to his words of eternal life. And they turned and walked away. And then at that point, Jesus turned around and said, you're going to leave too. Now, it's interesting to note, if you'll, of course, I've been pastoring here, this November will be, November 30th will be 20 years, pastoring right here in Danielshire. And, uh, but I've preached all across the country. And uh, I've gone in the church situation where, you know, for whatever reason, people left church. But I wonder how many people have left church over one misunderstanding. Over one misunderstanding. Now what's interesting is that Jesus did not stop them and say, Whoa, wait a minute. You didn't understand. You misunderstood what I said. He didn't try to even correct that. He let them go. See, Jesus wants you to sell out 100% to him. He wants you to become a disciple of him. He wants you to get to, to fall in love with him so much that no way could anybody ever offend you that would cause you to walk away from him. Did you know you can't hurt my feelings bad enough to cause me to walk 
caused me to walk away from Jesus. You can't say enough bad things about me. Hallelujah. Because Jesus has been too good to me. Hallelujah. But I've seen people leave over one misunderstanding and they forgot that when they walked into that church that that man standing behind the pulpit preaching the word of God he had the words of eternal life that was able to get them out of darkness into this marvelous light. They forgot about the time in the middle of the night they called that preacher to come and lay his hands on that flaxen-haired little girl and pray the prayer of faith over that fevered brow and the fever leaf. They forgot all of that over one misunderstanding. I just talked to a pastor that had a, a family in his church. Hallelujah. That uh, his church was loving them and just that they just once sung in the choir, and they honored him in the choir on a Sunday morning. And after Sunday night service, told him they was leaving, going to another church across town. Hallelujah. Sad to say, the other church across town, got right in, my, hallelujah, let's get right up here on the platform. Sad to say. Hallelujah. Because where they went to don't really love them. Don't really love them. Hallelujah. What that pastor should have done, what you doing over here? You see, it's never the will of God to tear down one church and build another. That's never the will of God. It, it doesn't work like that. And you know what? I want people to be a part of the ministry of this church. I want them to be. But I want them saved more than I want their talent. They've got to learn to eat out of the trough where they're being fed. Amen. But that's the reason I can go preach in Mount Pleasant. I can go preach in Pittsburgh. I can go preach everywhere around here. And they uh, they understand. <laughs> Hallelujah. My, my saints are safe. Brother White. Because I think it's important. Hallelujah. I think it's important. Hallelujah. But over one misunderstanding, people forget. And Jesus is interested in making a disciple. You know, it's a lot easier to pray somebody through than it is to, for them to become a disciple of Jesus Christ. And Jesus is not interested in you just praying through. He wants you to pray through. He wants you to, to come out of that world. But He wants you to allow His Spirit and His love and His glory and His church to help make you a disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ, a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ, that you where you're not carrying your feelings on your shoulder, you're devoted to the Lord Jesus Christ and to His principles and His work. And so the key is, is you've got to look at the cost of the building. Jesus said, if you're going to be my disciple, and He, he gives two illustrations there, a builder and then a king who's going to war. If you're going to build, you don't just jump out and start building. You count the cost. That once you jump out involved in it all, that you don't have enough to finish it. So you got to build on the right kind of foundation. Now, I don't know, most of us, when we come to God, we were so messed up and, and sin and so messed up in our lives and our world was topsy-turvy. Hallelujah. Anything got to be better than this. Lord, whatever you ask me to do, whatever sacrifice, whatever, anything has got to be better than this. No sacrifice. No sacrifice that he would ask me to do is even a sacrifice 
in light of what he is bringing me out of and what he has delivered me from there's no sac he no sacrifice too great that he would ask of me I was praying this morning and I was thinking about where I'd be if if Jesus hadn't have found me there's nothing you can't ask me it's not too hard to live for God in light of the fact that what he delivered me out of and he saved me at 11 years old he picked me up as a child in a world that was topsy turvy and I was able to change the cycle that my children do not have to deal with some of the things that I was having to deal with. I remember as a kid singing, I'll go where you want me to go. I'll say what you want me to say. And I'll do what you want. I remember weeping and crying as a teenager singing that song. I still mean it. Hadn't changed my mind on it. Because the cost of discipleship and become a follower of Jesus Christ. The benefits. The benefits. What I have received to be a disciple of Him far outweighs. Don't feel sorry for me. It's been an exciting journey. Hallelujah. And I've seen the hand of God. I've seen the blessings of God. Even when the storm clouds were dark and the waves were billowing and it seemed like my boat was rocking back and forth and I didn't know whether I was going to make it to the other side or not. Uh, amen. But we got through it. We come through. <laughs> when my back was against the wall, and I didn't know where the answer was going to come and what, how it was going to come about. We got through it. We got through it. We got through it. Can I tell you, this too shall pass. You just got to endure to the end. Don't bail out. Don't give up. Don't give in. Don't give out. You just got to come to church not out of feeling. You can't come to church out of feeling. You got to come because it's your duty. You understand that it is. That it's important to you. You've heard me say it many times. My children, Tiffany, never had to ask us, are we going to church? On a church service, she never had to say, Hey, are we going to church? <laughs> because it was established very early in her life that if there's church going on, we were going to be there. Hallelujah. And, and, we, and she found out that a little headache, you know, the kind of headache that lets you go to work but won't let you go to church. That's the kind of headache I'm talking about. Now, or the kind of tummy ache that lets you go ahead and work, but it won't let you go and sit on some nice fatty pews in a nice air-conditioned building with a lot of people that love to smile and love you all the time. That's just hard to do that. Hallelujah. But you can go in an old stinky machine shop, people cussing all around you and with that same tummy ache. You, you know what I'm talking about. See, you've got to establish in your walk with God what is top priority. What is the most important thing? 
that I can do for my family? What's going to be more important? Now, I know you need to provide for your family. I know that's important. The Bible teaches us that. We don't, you know, we don't advocate you going to quit your job. But you've got to get some right priorities. Hallelujah. You know, there's 24 hours in a day. 24 hours in a day. And uh, 160 eight hours in a week. And if you just give God 30 minutes a day, that's taking three, that leaves 164 and a half hours. And you work 40 hours a week, You know, that leaves you 124 more hours and a half hours. Well, let's say you sleep. You sleep eight hours a day. Yeah, that's wishful thinking, I know. Now, some, that's not enough. <laughs> At least you're honest, Paul. Hallelujah. That leaves you 78 hours to do whatever you want to do. Wow. I'm talking about top priorities. If prayer changes things, can prayer change things in your family? Can prayer change things in your life? I'm not saying just one time of prayer, but I'm talking about getting to a consistent of prayer. And I promise you that if you if you will do that, you may say, well, that, that, that costs me too much to get. That takes too much of my time. 30 minutes a day. Did you know that let the doctor tell you the big C word and 30 minutes a day is not very long. It's not enough time every day to pray. Let a tragedy or a situation come in your life. You know what? It's, it's real easy to find time. But I think God is trying to teach this church some principles about discipleship. That it's important that we learn to pray. We we so you don't start the house, you get the foundation right. And I was so excited to to walk in here and, and see Monty's and JJ and Stan's name on our sign in sheet of coming prayer. And uh, because if you can establish a prayer life and be consistent with it, see, nobody backslides that's got a prayer time, consistent prayer life. You just don't backslide having a consistent prayer life. You just don't backslide. Hallelujah. You, you just... The, hallelujah. It, it just don't happen if you have a consistent prayer life. You just, you don't give up. Because, you know what? The devil trembles. Listen to me. The devil trembles when he sees the weakest Christian down on their knees praying. He trembles. Because he knows that God, in their weakness, they can be made strong. Because their understanding is not in me. It's not in my ability. It's not in my strength. But it's in Him. It's in Him that we live and move 
and to have our being. Hallelujah. It's kind of like when David went to fight Goliath. His weapons that he had didn't look like too much. A little sling. A little, po- little boy's weapon. But the giant, he had all this armor on. He had an unbelievable huge sword, a spear. He had an armor barrier. He had a big shield. I mean, he looked apart. I mean, he'd been defiling the armies of Israel 40 days. The number 40 is significant in the Bible, brother. It really is. But for 40 days, and you know what? Hallelujah. A little boy that didn't have a whole lot of warrior ability. With just a sling and a nail. Hallelujah. Took care of that 40 days of the father and the armies of Israel. He reached down into that brook on his way to fight Goliath and got him five smooth stones. Somebody said that was for J E S U S. I really don't think that because Goliath had four brothers. I think he got those extra four stones in case Goliath's four brothers wanted any part of his God. Amen. Hallelujah. I sure do. And David, Goliath looked at David and said, Look at this little weekend. You sent a boy out here. And David looked at him and said, You come to me with a sword and a shield, but I come to you in the name of the Lord. In his weakness, he's made strong. Hallelujah. And he slung that stone, that smooth stone, and it hit the only place unprotected, right there in the city. Knocked him out, and he cut his head off with his own sword. And you know what happened to all them guys that were them warriors? When David got victory, man, they come out of their tent screaming and hollering and chased the Philistines. The Philistines got to running from them. And for 40 days, they'd been fine. But God took care of it with one weak little boy that came in the name of the Lord. Hallelujah. You know, it's not God and the devil. power. The devil's down on the totem pole. It's God and his church and when you're a part of that church and you're a, you're a regardless, hallelujah, of, of strong or weak or whatever, if you come in the name of the Lord and you've submitted your will to God, I'm here to tell you, hallelujah, there's power and there's strength behind you and you're able, amen, to move forward in God. But you establish some things in your early walk with God. You know, some people, apparently, they get by with the least amount of church of anybody I ever seen. I mean, just, can you imagine people that can get by with just a very least amount of church? Hallelujah. I can't do it. I. Amen. I'm, I'm there Sunday morning, Sunday night. I'm, I'm there for family time, prayer. Hallelujah. Try to be as much as possible unless I'm out of town. Hallelujah. Wednesday night. A lot of times when, when we're having off nights, I'm somewhere else in church. I have to have a lot of church. Hallelujah. Keep me going. But some folks can get by with very little. Amen. Maybe your devil is just not as big as I have to fight. Amen. But I don't think so. You see, Jesus taught those who contemplated following him using the illustration of a man building a tower. 
anyone planning a project of such proportion would certainly sit down and first count the cost to see if we had sufficient funds to finish the project. Beginning to build without doing so could result in a foundation in place but insufficient capital to complete the job. The outcome of this would be the scorn of those who beheld his faith and mocked him because he was unable to finish. You know, within ourselves, within ourselves, we do not have sufficient means which which to serve God and to complete this Christian effort. We do not need to fear. However, for God has provisions. He's already built these provisions in. If we are willing to pay the price required of us, he then will supply the rest. You see, the scripture often describes living for God or walking with him and being his disciple in terms of building. And when you study these illustrations and learning from them, can be of tremendous benefit to us so that we do not fail. Because you want to be successful in living for God. Jesus likened our response uh, to the word to that of two men. One who built on sand and the other on rock. In Matthew chapter 7 verses 24 through 29. We're building our lives on one or the other. Either we're building it on sand or we're building it on rock. Hallelujah. And the house that's built on the sand, the storms and the winds can come, and that house won't stand. But the house that's built on the rock, which is Christ Jesus, that house is going to stand. Regardless of which one we choose, we will encounter the same storm. Isn't that ironic? Regardless of which, which one you build on, you're going to encounter the same storm. Storm. So you might as well build on the rock. Hallelujah. So your house will stand the test of time. So that your life, regardless of when the strong winds blow, I'm living for God. Hallelujah. i got my eyes on Jesus. Hallelujah. Now you can't get your eyes on people. Because people are people. And people sometimes do dumb things. Amen. So you can't get your eyes on people. You know, I worked with a guy one time, and he said he didn't, he didn't go to church said because there's all them hypocrites there. I told him, I said, well, there's room for one more. I said, you won't go to church with this. This makes real good sense to me. You don't want to go to church with them, but yet you're going to go to hell with them. I said, that really makes real good sense to me. Well, and you don't want to have anything to do with hypocrites. You better quit dealing with. I mean, there's a whole list of folks out there that, hallelujah, professing to be something that's not. You just going to have to stop living. But for there to be a hypocrite, there's got to be a real. And did you know something also awful unique is that God talks about letting the tares grow with the wheat. But if you try to tear the tares out too quick, you'll hurt the wheat. God's going to do the separate. Amen. He got a church within the church. You got a church within a church. I was reading a deal about leadership and this uh, this morning, and and uh, I guess when you get up at five, you get a lot of chance to get get to read a lot of things, you know. Hallelujah! And so uh, I was reading about leadership, and it talked about those that uh, were willing to work, and then talking about Nehemiah when he got ready to build. The, the wall, he worked with those that were willing to work. And those that didn't want to be involved, they were just, he called them uh, shirkers. They shirked in their responsibility. 
He said, if you're not careful, you'll spend all your time worrying about those that don't want to get involved. And you know what? Alan, he nailed my hide to the wall. I'm guilty. Because I worry about them that just don't seem to want to be involved. And he said, what you need to do is start zeroing in and spend time with those that really want to be involved and those that really want to work. Because Nehemiah would have never got the wall built if he'd have worried about those that didn't want to be involved. He had to just work with those that presented themselves and that wanted to be involved and wanted to work. If we're going to have a revival, I guess that's what we're going to have to do. We're going to just those that willing and want to be work want to work. I've got a message I haven't preached it yet. It's how to how to kill a church without trying. The key word there is without trying. Hallelujah. Hadn't preached it yet. I've had it a long time. Been been tempted. I've brought it in my little folder many times to preach it, but I hadn't preached it yet. Now we may be getting closer. I don't know. But see, I see God. And watching the hand of God begin to work in their life and begin to make them a disciple as they submit to pastoral authority, as they're submitting their life to God. And watching God begin to mold and begin to make Get all the roughness out, the rough edges, polishing it all up. That is the joy of pastor. Years, several years ago, and I still go back to that. We we need to do it again. We had a on Pentecost Sunday. We had we flashed. We had several testimonies. We had before and after pictures. Or we had before pictures and had them just standing there after. And flash pictures of, of before when they come, before they come to God. And when you looked at the picture and you saw what was standing there testifying, the contrast was so alarming of what God is able to do to take a life and put his spirit within them and begin to change and mold and make them into a vessel of honor. You look up there at the picture, their countenance are totally different than what God has done. Hallelujah. That is, to me, that's the joy. The joy of pastor. It's kind of like the architect takes a, just a piece of granite stone And he looks at that and sees what it can be. And that's what God does in our life. Not what we are. But what we can be in him. If we will be totally submitted unto him. And count the cost of discipleship. Understand up front. It's one day at a time. Half-hearted living for God is no good. Being a lone reign Christian, God don't have, there's no such thing. Hallelujah. Many years ago, I had somebody just come by visiting. Well, what church? Oh, I just go to wherever I feel like it. They just, wherever, when they wake up on Sunday morning, whatever the Lord leads them, that's where they go. That is as unscriptural as anything you'll ever find. Hallelujah. Just wandering around. They won't ever get established in nothing. Because they won't ever stay long enough to get the right kind of teaching in their life. And I will be honest with you, Jesus is not really interested in just quick fixes. He's wanting to make you into a disciple of Jesus Christ that you can be a power witness of His glory. And what he can do with a life. Oh, 
you're talking about a time we're going to have when we get over on the other side. When we come marching through those gates, singing the song of the redeemed. Hallelujah. And you know what? You know, I've been asking here long enough. I remember when many of you came into this church with your life kind of messed up. But to see what God has done and is doing, all I can say is to God be the glory. And you know what the neat thing is? Look around you. Don't you just look around you. As you this is not the finished product yet. He's still working on us. He's still working on us. He's not through with us yet. But he's still working in our lives to make us into a vessel of honor. And it's important. It's important that you build on that right kind of foundation. We find that we, the church, are built upon the foundations of the apostles and prophets with Jesus Christ being the chief cornerstone according to Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 20 and 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 4 and 8 and Isaiah 28 and 16. Christ cannot just be one of many building blocks in our lives. Let me say that again. Christ cannot just be one of the many building blocks in our lives. We must build our lives upon Him. And since Christ is the foundation, the chief cornerstone, no other foundation can be laid. Therefore, we use caution in how or what we build upon this foundation according to 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 10 through 15. We're to build up ourselves in our most holy faith, praying in the Holy Ghost. Jude 20. Being rooted, built up in Him, and established in the faith will keep us from being spoiled through philosophy of vain deceit after human traditions and after the rudiments of this world, according to Colossians chapter 2, verse 6 through 8. The word of His grace is able to build us up according to Acts chapter 20 and verse 32. Jesus wants you to make it. He's made provision for you to make it. The neat thing about it, you can draw as close to God as you want to draw to Him. He says, you draw nigh unto me and I will draw nigh unto you. It's not that it's not predicated on how long you've been in church. It's not predicated on, on what your pedigree is. It's not, pedi it's not uh, uh, based on, on, on what kind of life you live. Because once you come through the blood, you have no past. Did you hear me? Once you come through the blood, you have no past that Jesus knows anything about. He forgets about the mistakes of yesterday. And you start with a brand new life. A clean slate. You're writing a brand new book in your life. A chapter in your life. Totally different from the one that there was. That's what's so beautiful about God. We go through the blood. Oh, Halabahusataya. You're talking about mercy. You're talking about the goodness of the Lord. That's what Calvary purchased. Is that his blood could wash away all of our failures and all of our mistakes of yesterday. A new beginning. We add to this. Hallelujah. Built, beginning with the foundation of Christ and our faith in Him, we are to add to our faith. Y'all come. We are to add to our faith and build on this foundation seven things in order to secure our position 
in Christ according to 2 Peter chapter 1 and verse 3 through 10. See, for you to receive the Holy Ghost, you had to have faith. Every man is given a measure of faith. You had to believe that God was going to fill you with the Holy Ghost. So you had to have faith. And it's impossible to come to God without faith. It's impossible to please God without faith. So you had to have faith. You had to believe that God was going to you and that God would fill you with all of this. Now, to your faith, you add virtue. And to virtue, knowledge. And to knowledge, temperance. And to temperance, patience. And to patience, godliness. And to godliness, brotherly kindness. And the brotherly kindness, charity. And see, when we build our lives in such a fashion, it assures us of the following things according to the Apostle Peter. It assures us that of not being barren. We'll get some stars in our crown because we will witness, we'll see souls come to God. It assures us of not being unfruitful, of not being blind and unable to see afar off. Our vision clears up. Of not forgetting that we have been purged from our sins. He purged us. And he also assures us of not falling. <laughs> Hallelujah. Of not going back into that world. Don't you want to add to your faith virtue? Virtue, knowledge, to knowledge, temperance, temperance, patience, patience, godliness, godliness, brotherly kindness, and the brotherly kindness, charity. You know, I don't really find in the scripture where I've got a right just to be mean to people. The greatest thing that a minister has in his life is his integrity. And I live in a last house. No matter where I go, as a minister of the gospel and as an ambassador of Jesus Christ, the same with you. You never know. It may be at the boardwalk in Kima, Texas, that you walk into a Thomas Kincaid art gallery. Just looking. And the young man comes out and begins to talk to us. And he said, wasn't you with harvest time? I said, yes, sir, I was. Your brother Watkins? I said, yes, sir. The little did I know, I had met that young man at Texas Bible College when we were there one year doing harvest time. And when I shook his hand at that time, he told me two things. He's only had this happen two times in his life. Once with another preacher and then once with me. And he said, that's how I remembered you. And he said, uh, I'm not going to tell you what it was, but he saw something when I shook hands with him in my eye. And he only had that happen twice. And I don't know why all that God had all that happen. I just think that the steps, your steps are ordered of the Lord. God just has you at the right place at the right time. And, and I think somewhere down the line, I'm going to be able to help that young man. Because God doesn't just do things by chance. And he was getting ready to make a major decision in his life. And God had us there right at that right time. 
But God wants you to live for Him. He wants you to be His disciple. And don't look around. You don't have to look around and say, well, I can't ever be like that or I can't. You can be anything you want to be in God. As you dedicate your life to God and as you totally surrender your will into His hand, be all you can be. Hallelujah. The call to discipleship. Count that cost. Dear Lord, I love you and I appreciate you. I want to thank you, God, for the privilege to count the cost and then the cost to build and building on the right foundation in our lives. Establishing some things in our life and in our walk with You that cannot be shaken. Lord, I want to thank You for the things that You place in my life. I want to thank You, Lord, for the standards of holiness that You placed in my heart. But it's important that I hold to the truths that were handed down to me. And I want to impart them into this congregation to see what you've, you've done in my life and are doing, duplicated in others according to your word. So, Lord, as we come before you today to submit ourselves afresh and anew to you, I want to thank you for the work that you have started in JJ and Monty and in Stan. Thank you for trusting us. with their life. And I'm asking you, God, to lay your hand upon them and guide them day by day. And when the enemy would come in like a flood, the Spirit of the Lord would raise up a standard against it. For God, you can do in them and make them a vessel of honor as they submit their will into your hand. (laughs) To such a point, God, there's already been a change. But that's just the beginning of what you desire to do. Give them the strength, I pray. And Lord, meet with them every time they kneel to pray. Let them feel your love and your glory. And it just becomes stronger and stronger each day. We'll ever praise you, Father. We'll ever thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You know, our our Christian society is real big about joining churches. In join or join up. But the church that Jesus is building, you can't join it. You have to be born into it. For except the man is born again. He cannot see the kingdom of God. And then he went on to say, except you're born of water and of spirit, you cannot enter into that kingdom. And the kingdom he's talking about is the church. Hallelujah. I'm thankful that I've been born again of the water and of the spirit. 
and that Christ lives within. Why don't we stand? We're going to ask our praise singers to sing a chorus, however they feel. And we just want to feel after the presence of God for just a moment. And if, if you walked into this service with any kind of a need, why don't you just come stand up in the front? Hallelujah. God can meet whatever that need is. Whatever it is. There's, there's, whatever need it is. Hallelujah. You know, it's, it's dependent about your response. Hallelujah. Anybody else? This is all the folks would need. Her chest of God. I'm born of his spirit. I've been washed in his blood. This is my Oh, the 